We are live. Welcome, everybody, to, of course, what are always very special webinars with Wine Access. Today is a little extra special because we are discussing the illustrious world of Armenian wines. Lots to be learned today, so I'm very excited to be here with our very esteemed panelists. Um, I am going to introduce each of them one by one. Uh, my name is Devanshi Mazrani, by the way, with Hope Living. Um, so yes, I'm going to introduce each of our panelists one by one and read a little bit about them to give some background info. Um, I invite everybody who is on with us today to ask questions, feel free to comment on the Q&A and the chat that we have going. Um, and time permitting, we will try to answer as many questions as possible before the end. But uh, thank you everybody for being here. And here we go. So first and foremost, our men Kachaturian, uh, who holds a Bachelor of Science degree in business with an emphasis in wine business strategies. And he has attained the WESET Intermediate Diploma with honors. In addition to him being a guest lecturer for both the University of California, Davis and Sonoma State University, Armen is a published author, as well as a segment producer for stomtv.com. For more than 15 years, his passion for fine wine and proven expertise in luxury sales have been evident throughout his career as a wine industry manager. In the fall of 2020, Armen joined the Morlet Family Vineyards team as the national sales manager. Working closely with distributors, he is responsible for placing the highly allocated and sought after Morlet Family Vineyards wines in premier restaurants and specialty wine shops across the country. Our men also oversees U.S. placement for Pierre Morlet champagnes imported from France. Welcome, our men. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Next up, we have Jason Wise. Filmmaker Jason Wise graduated from Chapman University's Dodge College of Film and Television in 2005. In 2012, Jason directed the acclaimed wine documentary, Som, which put the existence of the sommelier into the American consciousness and was one of the most watched documentaries of the year. Som was turned into a television series by Esquire Network titled Uncorked in 2015, and Jason served as an executive producer of all six episodes. In 2015, Wine Enthusiast Magazine named Jason one of the 40 most influential people in the world of beverages under the age of 40. Congratulations. Uh, Jason directed two follow-up films, Psalm Into the Bottle in 2016 and Psalm 3 in 2018. In 2017, he released Wait for Your Laugh, a highly acclaimed documentary of the, on the 90-year career of showbiz performer Rosemary. With the success of the Psalm series, Wise launched Psalm TV, a streaming service dedicated to wine, food, and travel. His latest film, The Delicacy, premiered in 2020 at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. And the next Psalm film comes out in the beginning of 2021. Welcome, Jason. Thank you for being here as well. Hey, it's an honor to be asked. I appreciate it. Oh, it's our pleasure. Um, next up, familiar face, of course, Kamal Hachandani. Um, Kamal co-founded his highly celebrated luxury platform, Hope Living, over 15 years ago in Miami, Florida building a network and audience of some of the most affluent and successful business people, philanthropists, entrepreneurs, and celebrities in key US and international markets like New York, LA, Miami, London, Dubai, and more. His personal affinity and love of fine wine led to partnerships with some of the most celebrated wineries and spirits houses in the world, such as Dom Perignon, Cristal, Louis Tress, Armand de Bregnac, and Perrier Jouet as well as cover features with some of the most noteworthy figures in the fine wine world, including Francis Ford Coppola, Bill Harlan, Marguerite Mondavi, among others. He has been featured in globally renowned publications for his wealth of knowledge, specifically in the celebrity and athlete wine space, like ESPN's The NBA's Secret Wine Society and Le Monde's L'Anologie L'Autre Terrain de Jeu de la NBA in France, and facilitated monumental wine experiences like assisting the legendary Kobe Bryant in launching his wine, uh, his watch rather, at the Napa Valley Reserve. Taking this one step further, he most recently launched Hope Wine Society under the Hope Living umbrella, which is a digital platform dedicated to fine wine and spirits featuring exclusive content with like-minded wine aficionados like Carmelo Anthony, Sting, Jimmy Butler, Luis Fonsi, Ludacris Lebron, Lebron James, and several more. Welcome, Kamal. Thank you very much. Pleasure. 
And last but certainly not least is Vanessa Conlin. Vanessa was head of sales and marketing for several of Napa's most prestigious estates, including Arietta Wines, Dana Estates, and Realm Cellars. Previously, she was a retail buyer and wine bar wine director in New York. She is president of the board for the Jameson Animal Rescue Ranch, holds the We Set Diploma, and was the recipient of the Nikki Singer Memori Memorial Scholarship from the International Wine Center. Vanessa became the 52nd Master of Wine in the United States in February of this year. Welcome, Vanessa. Thank you, Devanshi. Thanks so much for having me, Kamal Hope Living. Um, as always, it's such a pleasure to, uh, to see you virtually and to, to talk about wine. Likewise, the feeling is very mutual. Um, so before we get started, I am going to put in the chat here for all of our um, guests uh, two links. The first link is a link to the Psalm TV video on um, the film that was released on Armenian wine for everybody to watch, which I have just put up there. And um, I am now also putting the link to check out and look at some of the wines um, that we'll be discussing today. Uh, one of which we'll be tasting. So for anybody that's interested in purchasing them, please feel free to click this link that is now also in the chat. Um, and I will now hand it off to Vanessa to actually introduce um, the wines that we'll be discussing today. Absolutely. So um, as Devanshi said, um, on wineaccess.com um, backslash Armenia, you can view um, six wines that um, that Armen and Jason and I tasted together recently. Um, and you can watch the video of us tasting and discussing them on the SOM TV link um, that Devanshi put in the chat as well. Um, so there's a, a, um, a variety. There's a traditional method sparkling wine, which I think we all actually have in our glasses right now, the non-vintage origins Kush traditional method sparkling wine. Um, uh, white wine, red wine. Uh, what I think I'd love to focus on um, is is the one that's in our glass since we don't have a, a ton of time. But um, uh, I did want to mention if you're logging into Wine Access from the West Coast right now, this wine is sold out. We'll, we will be replenishing it. If you're on the East Coast, this is still available for purchase. Um, and Armin, I'd love for you to jump in here as well. But this is a traditional method sparkling wine. Um, what has really impressed me about all the wines from Armenia that I've tasted is um, the affordability. So this is a $22 wine, which when you think about all of the labor, the love, the hand touch that goes into making traditional method is, is pretty phenomenal. Um, and it's a blend of two varieties. Uh, one I'm going to pronounce and one I'm going to make Armen pronounce. <laughs> so it's 60% Voskahat. And uh, Armen, why don't you help me out here with uh, the other one? The other one is Katuni. 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 Yes. I, okay. You got to get um, the th, huh, but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but it's it's really a beautiful expression. Uh, when Jason and Armin and I tasted this recently for some TV, I was struggling to try to um, try to sort of not compare these wines to other wines from the world um, to put them in context. But I actually think it's probably the best way to do that because these are completely like nothing I've ever tasted, but they are reminiscent of, of world-class wines from other wine regions. So what this reminded me of more than anything is Francia Corta. Um, you do get, of course, that like beautiful autolytic note from the traditional method, this bright zingy acidity, but there's a gorgeous textural component to it, this kind of um, spherical feel on the palate that sort of reminds me of, of that balance of Francia Corta where you get the beautiful acidity and this like very intriguing texture. It really is such a pretty, pretty wine. Uh, I love uh, blind tasting my friends on it that are all wine professionals. And, uh, you know, it kind of makes you stop and think, what is this in my glass? It's, it's familiar, yet it's not. And I think, um, you know, the affordability really allows people to, uh, you know, um, explore. And, uh, you know, you don't need to explore with a $200 bottle. You can explore with a $22 bottle. And the beauty of wine is, you don't like it you move on to something else that you like eventually you'll find something you like but this has been a crowd pleaser so when you talk about the familiar familiarity with it our men what would you um compare it to with so for some people like myself who are a little less familiar with armenian wines um because it does you're right it absolutely does it's the first sip i just took and i was like this tastes like something i've had and would have and i'm not necessarily familiar with it 
Well, I think the sparkling aspect of it is what's familiar. Uh, most people have had sparkling wine in you know one form or another, and that's kind of what's familiar. Um, it has bright acidity, which is, which is familiar as well. Um, but it's fun. It's it's uh, it doesn't it's it's really well integrated. It's not bitter. It's not sweet. Uh, it's really well balanced. Very food friendly, um, which is a big part of the Armenian culture is food. Uh, all I remember from my childhood is sitting around tables and eating food. <laughs> you know, for isn't hours. That, isn't that what hours. you do now? That's what you do now. So <laughs> I, I try. I try. I want to. I just can't as 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 I used to when I was younger. It just doesn't. You know, the calories catch up a lot quicker. I but think no, I, growing up, I remember Armenian weddings. There were coffee cups at uh, the Armenian wedding tables, and they would, um, in the middle of dinner, they would flip over all the coffee cups. And that adds pedestals to put more platters of food. Not even kidding you. You have a table with platters and then coffee cups reversed. So now they're, uh, uh, you know, you have more platters on top of it. So it's always been about food, but this the wine is uh, so food friendly. So I think one thing you're describing, Armin, that needs to be pointed out is this is, this may be inexpensive and I'm concerned talking about it the way we are is going to make that change. But the, um, <laughs> this is this is made by an extraordinarily talented winemaking team. I think that that you can make the concept of being able to make well executed and really good wine in almost any place in the world is not always possible. But I would say when you have somebody as talented as Amy and Vahe Kashkarian, who I know, I mean, I should say why I'm on this panel is because I have uh, another feature film I've directed that takes place in Armenia coming in 2021. And uh, I know these people very intimately and very well. And aside from that, they are incredibly good winemakers. This wine is made, you know, it's not just made in a, you know, champagne method, which anybody with the facilities could do. This is made by people who know how to do that. And it is picked before it is ripened. It is done with the proper dosage. It is handled with the right acidity. It is made by people who could be making wine in champagne. They could be making wine in French Accorta. That, that I think is the most important thing that I observed about these particular winemakers and really any of the wines that we're talking about is that they are really, really good winemakers and that matters a lot. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And one thing about Vahe Kushgarian um, and his daughter, Amy, uh, Vahe made wine in Italy as well. Uh, it's not like, you know, he was a guy who grew up in Armenia and said, I'm going to make sparkling wine. Um, he had a restaurant in San Francisco. He uh, you know, lived in the States. He lived in Italy. He had a winery there. He ended up moving to Armenia because uh, 20 years ago, he was like, there's something here. And well, he's he, also in our, he also is Armenian and fought yeah. in the Lebanese war. I mean, this is a guy who has walked and, and talked and breathed, you know, this culture though. I mean, I want to make that clear too. Sure. So uh, for him, for him to be able to do that, he's done, he's done a lot. It's not just, he made sparkling wine. He did a lot of research on what grapes are even planted in this country because they were just vineyards and the village took care of the vineyard and that was it. No one really looked and said, well, what bridal is this? You know, uh, how old are these vines? What do we need to do? Let's take a look at the soil. So he really was one of the first to say, okay, let's take a look at serious winemaking in Armenia. And um, Jason, in your time out there, uh, did you visit a lot of wineries or vineyards? Oh, you bet. Um, yeah, it was a very, you know, production tends to be quite an intense process. The sleep is not even fifth on the priority list. Um, yeah, we visited as much as we could. We were spent quite a bit of our time on the border. You know, I know that politics wants to be avoided on this, but I must say Armenia is not surrounded by uh, very friendly neighbors. And so a lot of us filming and a lot of where these grapes are grown are on the edge of hostile places and very high, high elevation. And so, yeah, I visited quite a few wineries and, and met winemakers that ranged from former Soviet winemakers from the 70s and 60s to very progressive people like Amy, you know, who are changing the face of this very small, but very historically important country. And um, yeah, it sort of runs quite, quite a gamut of kind of what there is. But one thing I can tell you about the soil and the climate and the place is it is poised to absolutely explode with fantastic wine. I mean, I, I say this not as a sommelier, not as a winemaker, but as somebody who documents stories. And I can tell you, this place is a ticking time bomb of incredible wine that I hope to God stays as affordable as it is right now. That's great to know. I mean, Kamal, I don't know um, if you want to speak a little bit about 
you know, Kamal is obviously very um, familiar with most of the fine wines that come out of, you know, France, Italy, a lot of the, Napa, a lot of the more traditional or more well-known um, regions. But what is your level of familiarity with Armenian wines, Kamal, as sort of a newer consumer into it? Well, for me, it's more about the Armenian culture. I have a few very, very close friends that I consider family. And as Armin, as you were saying, referencing the weddings and to me, sort of the generosity and how things really evolved around food. And truly my favorite food in the world, I would say top two is Armenian food. Um, whenever I could get it in New York or the different places and uh, or out in, uh, in California, it is new to me, but from the research that I've done and from seeing, you know, from what I've learned from you guys, seeing the history and how it dates back and understanding the climate and um, the terroir out there from some of the research I did, I could see why it's such a burgeoning wine market. And obviously, as you said, there's great value, but you know, and things like that, you can also have great quality. So I'm excited about this journey, but it all stems from my love of the Armenian culture, my friends, and just their love and generosity, um, just as humans, and um, even seeing what they're going through now and how they collectively have banded together as a community and a culture is made it something I've fallen in love with, you know, with my friends that I said have become a family over time, you know, working with them, playing with them, and most importantly, enjoying, you know, that, that meals with them. That's beautiful. And um, since you brought up a little bit of culture and history, um, our men, we'd love to hear from you a little bit about um, the Armenian history in, in wine specifically, because I learned quite a bit from Vanessa, so I'm excited to hear more, hear more from you as well. Well, you know, um, uh, growing up Armenian, you taught everything, you know, uh, Armenians invented everything, and it's kind of a running joke. Uh, and I kept telling all my friends growing up, I'm like, you know, Armenians invented wine. And of course, <laughs> there, it was tongue in cheek, but there was a little bit of that, you know, maybe we've been around long enough, we've probably had something to do with it. And I remember one morning, and I think it was 2006, uh, I started getting text message after text message. It was all uh, links to um, the cave they found, the uh, oldest modern uh, winery uh, in the world. It was an archeological site they found in Armenia. And all my friends were like, oh my God, you're right. Your, your people did invent it. The reality yeah. was there was no Armenia in 4200 BC. But it's in present day Armenia. Um, but if you look at historically, uh, with Herodotus writing about the Armenian wine merchants uh, traveling down to Euphrates and selling wine to the Babylonians. Um, so the, the history of Armenian wine has, and Armenians involved with wine, has been there. Um, now, uh, present day where we are today is very different because our, being around for thousands of years, you have. You know, different people who have ruled Armenia and it depended on who, you know, ruled the land. Uh, there were times where you had a few hundred years of zero winemaking because it was alcohol and it was not, you know, accepted um, at the time by the regime or the religion. So um, during uh, Soviet era, during, uh, Armenia was part of the USSR. Uh, they were tasked with making brandy. So once again, it still wasn't wine, but there was wine um, made in Armenia during the Soviet time in the Vyotstazor region, which um, the Yakubian Hobbs is. Uh, I believe uh, some of the Zulal stuff is coming out of there. There's a lot of great wineries in that region. And the reason was it was low yields and it was mountainous. And they're like, well, you can't make brandy from that stuff. It's too much work for a little amount of grape you're gonna get. So historically, you know, when you look at 6,000 years of, of history of winemaking, it's always been part of our DNA. That's uh, interesting, uh, definitely something that I wasn't familiar with. Um, and just to jump a little bit to a, to a different uh, question, Vanessa, maybe you can speak on this a little bit, a question that we had come in from one of our um, guests here today about the grapes in Armenia, how they differ from um, some of the other wine regions in the world. Well, they're unique to Armenia. Um, again, I, you know, I, I am, I'm still learning myself, you know, I by no means fancy myself a, a, an expert on Armenian wines. This is a journey for me, but I had to learn all of these things from scratch. So I, uh, I fully expect these to be uh, popping up on the MW exam uh, in the future as this, as this country and these regions become more familiar. But I'd say um, while they are reminiscent of, of, of certain other things, for instance, the, um, uh, the uh, one of the, the other wines that we tasted, the Zulal Vaskahat, um, 
really reminds me of Chenin Blanc, um, but they're, they're unique, um, but they share to me, uh, and we spoke about this on the SOM TV film, um, all a really beautiful racy acidity. Um, there's this sort of through line of savoriness. So anyone who I think particularly likes wines from, from the old world, would love would love these wines, you know, from Europe, um, and but they also have um, particularly the whites this very interesting textural component to it. I spoke a little bit about it with the with the Kush, but um, just for me, wine is so much more about the aromas and the flavors. But how does it actually feel uh, on your palate? You know, I talk a lot about sort of palate shape when I describe wines, and I just find that these wines have this just fascinating, really sort of sensual feeling um, on on the palate, and remarkably food friendly. I'd say um, across across the board, everything that we tasted, all six wines, um, just made me think immediately of, of, of foods that I wanted to pair with them. And food is always a topic we welcome here at Hot Living, especially. <laughs> so um, Jason and Kamal, um, Kamal I know is a huge foodie and loves Armenian um, culture and food, like he said, and Jason, you spent some time out there. Um, what were some of your highlights in terms of uh, cuisine related highlights in, in Armenia and uh, Kamal, you weren't in Armenia, but what would you look forward to trying in terms of pairing um, this wine and just in general um, with this wine? Well, overall, I reduced the amount of meats that I typically eat, but when it has been um, at some of my Armenian friends and so forth, the, you know, the barbecues and the way they've done it has made it um, it definitely worth uh, going back to it for, for a little bit of time. So I would, you know, I reflect back on those great barbecues with my friend Sergey or the Simonians that they really appreciate the art of food and entertaining and hospitality like no other culture that I um, have ever encountered with. And there's never been a time where you, you, have to un, you have to unbuckle your belt just based on the amount of food that they feed you. And if you don't eat it, which you're gonna eat it because it's so great, they're actually offended. So you actually end up eating double and triple. So you almost have to stay over at their place, um, which has happened before. So it all uh, comes down to their heart and hospitality. Yeah, I think if uh, I think if people haven't had Armenian food, there's some important things to talk about. Um, one, if I can take one step back to the previous question about what makes these grapes different, this is something that much of the next film I'm directed, you know, the feature film I'm directing, we'll, we'll get into, but you have to understand from a standpoint of grape parentage and genealogy, grapes all came from somewhere and the diaspora of those grapes were sort of thrown all over the earth uh, via war or religion or just eating food or whatever it is. Um, you have to understand this area of the Caucasus Mountains and some, you know, around the Mediterranean and then getting into the highlands of Iran, that's widely considered and I think would be considered fact to be the origin of Vitus vinifera, which is the grape that 90 9.999% of all the grapes we drink, you know, Bordeaux and Burgundy and Napa Cab and all this stuff, it's all the same species. And so, you know, the, the interesting thing about some of the grapes you're drinking in Armenia, Arani and, and Cyrene and, you know, Voskehat and all of these grapes, they are ancient. And when I mean ancient, I mean really ancient. And there's a lot of, I, I would say, very difficult things that have happened in this region for Georgia, for Armenia, for anywhere in the Caucasus, and that is because they're a crossroads. So it means two things, and it really impacts food and wine, but it also means that they've stayed with their grapes very provincial. You know, their grapes have been taken out early and then changed into the grapes we know in Italy and in all these other things. But currently, those grapes were very lucky to survive in a pr pretty pure form. I've been working with a grape geneticist in Madrid and one named Carol Meredith, who's been in our films, to try to pinpoint how ancient are these grapes. And really, there's not an answer because they are just, they just sit so far above Cab Franc and Chardonnay and Malbec and all these grapes that we are familiar with. But that also really impacts the food and more so than the grapes, because being a crossroads in the middle of, you know, the Silk Road changed many times. This place has been invaded by the Russians, by the Mongols, by every form of Turks that exists going back to the Seljuks and you have to understand by that happening, their food is taken on such an amalgamation that when you taste it, it's like a lot of things and unlike anything. And so, you know, I personally think that they're, um, you know, they do wraps and kebab and salads and the best pickled, they pickle better than anywhere I've ever had in my life, ever, 
anywhere. Nothing even sits on the same realm. And so when you have their pickled stuff, it's intense, but there's different levels and they pickle everything from watermelon to tomatoes to, you know, anything. And it goes very well with their wines. It's amazing. So it's a tough question to answer because I'm, I'm knee deep in making a film about this, but, but uh, strangely, it's, it's really, really, really interesting from a food and wine standpoint. So on that note, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Armenian red wines. Um, our men, I'd love to kick it off with you. We got a, a question people asking about um, specifically about Armenian red wine. So love to hear sort of a backdrop from you if you, if you don't mind. So 25 years ago, I tried my first Armenian red. Um, but at that time, it wasn't the kind of wines we're talking about today. It was like semi-sweet. It was basically, they call it semi-sweet. It was sweet red wine. Um, and it wasn't until 2013 or 14, I tried my first dry, really highly well-made red wine, and it said RNE on it. And it intrigued me because I'm like, okay, what, what's going on? RNE has been the grape that has almost taken over the, the red world of Armenian wines. Um, there are some other fun varietals as well, but RNE is really, along with Sireni, are the two that are kind of like competing um, for, for attention. I think RNE is going to be the one that everyone relates to. Uh, Sireni is going to be the one that you might one day graduate to if you come across it. There's just a lot less of it planted. These are also varietals. Um, th th these vineyards are also, you know, 50 to 100 years old. So it's not like you can go and plant a new vineyard today and say, oh, well, on the third or fourth leaf, we're going to get the same kind of quality fruit we're talking about. And, and if you plant new vineyards, it's not going to be the same wine. Um, but, you know, when you talk RNE, it comes in different kind of uh, uh, styles. And to me, the first thing it has to do with is the elevation. Uh, you know, whether you're 900 meter, 1000 meter, all the way up to 1700 meter elevation, that's where the, the style of the wine really starts developing. To me personally, my sweet spot has been the 13 to 1500 meter uh, elevation. Um, and it's just a personal preference of what I like based on my palate of what I've been drinking over the years. Um, but it's, it's a fun, fun wine. And once again, it has this amazing minerality to it. Uh, very food friendly, which, which goes well with what we've been talking about. And if I can just jump in for, for one moment too, I think it speaks really highly, you know, one of the wines that, that is on wine access and that um, we tasted on some TV is the Ukrainian Hobbs um, Arani. Um, so we're talking, you know, Paul Hobbs, who's arguably one of the most famous winemakers, you know, in the United States, you know, also makes wine in other places, Argentina, et cetera. But the fact that, that someone of his caliber is drawn to that variety to, to the region, I think um, speaks, you know, volumes for, for um, you know, the quality from the region and, and how interesting and delicious these varieties actually are. And Vanessa, since you mentioned at the beginning that it's sort of a new journey for you as well, can you tell us a little bit, a bit about your Armenian wine journey, where you started and where you are now? Because I'm sure Kamal um, would love to hear so he can sort of maybe mimic that as well. I know he's interested in this a lot too. So, Well, it, it really started honestly with our two other panelists here, our, um, our two guest panelists, I should say, Jason and, and Armen, um, in terms of in terms of kind of, you know, really opening my eyes. I mean, of course I'd read about the history of it, um, but in terms of actual, these sort of very uh, unique stories and personal experiences, um, it, it, my education really stems from them and from sitting down and, and tasting and tasting the wines. Um, I was actually supposed to go to Armenia uh, this past spring, which obviously didn't happen because of um, worldwide events. So uh, uh, at, a, at a date in the future, I, I will go in and look forward to having a more firsthand experience. But I would just say from, you know, from what I do at Wine Access, which is really to, to bring things forward that I find really fascinating to, to bring wines to life, to bring people on this wine journey um, that's, that's evolving. This is one of the most exciting the most exciting topics in, in a long, long time. And what I think is is so fascinating about it is, you know, I'm I'm learning about it, but in, in actuality, you know, this is as Jason was talking about, these the 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 vine varieties, you know, this region is is ancient. And so I think when looking at the story of this region or this country, like to to talk about where they've started and where they've come today and the fact that people can still go, you can buy wine for, you know, $20. 
from from this place is to me just it's so exciting. It's what I it's really what I love about wine. <laughs> Mal, how do you feel about that? Are you ready to go for the Armenian wine journey? Yeah, I mean anything with the culture I've been truly fascinated with and having great friends within that culture makes it a lot easier. And I, I hope myself as well to be able to, you know, join in Vanessa and what she's planning on doing and visiting Armenia. But in the meantime, you know, we did, we, we spoke with uh, the winemakers and the vintners, um, obviously with the panelists here and, and, and did tell their stories. So if you're on the Wine Access site and if you click in to read the full story, you can actually read about each individual wine where we'll go into more detail about, about the history of the place, the variety and the people that made it. Fantastic. And that's what we love. One of the things we love so much about Wine Access is telling those stories, um, which ties into even what Jason is doing and our men as well, just telling those stories because they're rich, rich stories that um, you know deserve to be heard. And especially if you're interested in the wines and in the process and this whole journey, it's really, um, it's great to have that out there. So thank you for that. Um, we have actually a question that came in um, from somebody asking about comparing Zora versus Yakubian Hobbs Areni. Um, it's interesting they mentioned Zora. That was actually the first one I had. Uh, I was at an event called Texom and someone had a bottle of it and I tasted it and I, 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 I started to freak out. I was like, wow, this is absolutely incredible. Um, but Zora was, uh, you know, one of the first to come out in the U.S. Uh, to be able to export here, you know, dry, uh, uh, not sweet at all, really well made. Um, and, uh, you know, their, their one wine was called Karasi and there's been some issues there because uh, there's another winery that said, well, we have the name Karas. Karas is amphora in Armenian. And um, uh, they made their wine in the old uh, ancient style of making the wines and the amphoras. Uh, you know, so it's, it's kind of hard to compare them. Um, they're both great in their own way. Uh, so if you get a chance, best thing to do is put them next to each other and try them, try them yourself. Perfect. And um, actually both our men and Jason, since you spent time out there and um, went visited the wineries, we got a question about um, the winemaking techniques uh, in Armenia. I don't know if you got to witness any firsthand. I'm, I'm hoping you did, which looks like you did based on that response. So I'd love to hear both of you speak a bit um, upon that. Armin, you want to take that or? Uh, I'm going to let you go. Okay. Well, I mean, Ar Armin is, uh, he's actually Armenian. I'm uh from Cleveland, which is not very close to Armenia. Um, the, uh, the, the winemaking style, I think is sort of, you know, hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn here, but it's a little up, it's a little tossed in the air right now because you have people bringing a lot of outside ways of making wine. There's something really fascinating down in the area that's, I, I guess for lack of a better term, disputed. The, uh, the area that there's a current war going on over right now is an area where you can find Caucasian oak which is an oak that is a different profile than French oak, Hungarian oak, Slovenian oak, the oaks that American oak, the oaks that we're used to tasting on wine. Um, oak is mostly from my experience, and I can only speak from that, used as a vessel in Armenia. It is not used as a flavoring device the way it is used in France, though I have seen French oak being used in uh, Armenia. Um, I think you kind of have a lot of people, and I like this about the way the, it's very pure there right now. And a lot of people are not using French oak to manipulate Arnie or Cyrene uh, very much the flavor. They're more using it for the way people use a oak as a vessel for a little bit of oxidation and things like that. Um, but like Armin said, there's a really, really rich history using amphora. And obviously if you go north to Georgia, you see quite a bit of that. They're very famous for their Kavevri. But if you look at Armenia, they've lost a lot of that that culture and history because of the Soviet occupation. And then of course the Ottoman occupation prior to that. And so you don't see, uh, you don't see clay used as much, at least I haven't. And I know that they've lost a bit of that in their, um, in their history, but it's kind of a toss up right now. And I think I personally prefer the ones because Arnie as a grape is just so magnificent. I could talk for another hour about how wonderful I think this, this is and the potential it has and all these other things, but it is just, it is a grape that doesn't need a lot of manipulation. It can be small or big, you know, it, it, I, I don't want to compare it to things. What if I had to, it'd be like a very light Syrah or a Mondeuse or something like that, but, but with more character in a lot of cases. 
Um, so it's a tough question to answer, but I've only seen a little bit, but I am, uh, man, am I excited about what they're going to do. Armin, do you want to try? Well, you know, um, there's, there's, uh, they do have some uh, uh, consulting winemakers going in uh, to Armenia. Michel Roland was the first. He's probably one of the most famous consulting winemakers in the world. Um, but Paul Hobbs as well. Uh, but they do have some consulting winemakers going going in and and you know kind of showing them what what they could do and what um, what's going on. So uh, you know, there's it's it's interesting. It's going to be interesting to see where where they go. Currently, the wines are pretty awesome. Um, I think there's uh, some good ageability on these wines. So I have a few cases in my cellar that I'm hoping to open up in 15, 20 years and, and uh, see if I was right or wrong. If I was right, I win. If I was wrong, you know, at least we tried, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. That's cool. and, 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 you know, Devante, something that, that I think is worth noting, which we haven't pointed out, um, just regarding these wines is, is the growing area there in terms of acreage is actually smaller than Napa Valley which is quite a small growing region. So even thinking about the fact that, um, that we have you know, these wines to try here, given, given the size of, of the growing region is, is really special. Vanessa, I can tell you, I've had to drive up and down the 29 many times, and it's taken me longer to get from one end of Napa Valley to the other than it has to get from one end of the country <laughs> of Armenia than the other. So I'm surprised, <laughs> frankly, yeah. you know, it's uh, wild to hear that. Yeah. That's funny. And Vanessa, since you brought that up, um, you know, it'd be great to hear how you think and maybe our men can chime in a little bit as well on how this will sort of affect Armenia as a wine, known, you know, as a wine region globally renowned, um, you know, in terms of its potential commercial success. Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, hopefully a lot of people are getting very excited about it from watching this. I know um, Jason's reach with his, you know, filmmaking is obviously much larger than, than anything uh, Iger or men could do individually. So I'm excited for people um, to, to watch the film as well. But um, I, I think what, what I want to speak to in terms of consumers who are just learning about this is one of the, I'd say the top five questions I get from consumers is what region is really exciting you now? And for the last several years, I've been sort of struggling to find like, well, what's really new? Um, what can I talk about where I genuinely have a passion that you have, you really need to go discover? And this is authentically something that I'm so excited about and, and, and really, really um, want to pass on that enthusiasm to the consumer. Armin, if you want. Um, you know, I, I would definitely agree with everything Vanessa just said. I mean, these, there's something happening in Armenia. Jason mentioned it as well. There's something happening with winemaking in Armenia. Um, they're, they're in this beautiful Renaissance period where they're discovering what varietals are even growing there and how to work best with them. Um, you know, some of the things they do, they produce in really small quantities. They don't leave the country, um, but they're, they're working really, really hard on trying to take what they have on their land and and uh, having to tell their story. So, you know, I mean, to me personally, this bottle of Kush tells a story. It tells a story of my people. It tells a story of history. Um, and it's all done through wine, which, uh, you know, wine wine tends to have that effect. It, it, it tells a story. And uh, this one is one that's, you know, approachable. I mean, you can probably pick up all six of these wines for, you know, $150. Um, and you, you can't really do that with a lot of other things. Um, so it's an exciting time for sure. And, uh, you know, wine tends to bring most people together. And if it doesn't bring you together, we're probably not going to hang out much, but you know, it's fine to drink alone, Armin. It's okay. It, yeah. <laughs> Only when the kids go to sleep, right? They never do from my experience, but <laughs> That, that's that's another Zoom conversation. That's another call. If you have children, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Um, well, you know, I know we actually went over time, so uh, I, I don't want to take up too much more of everyone's time. But I know, Jason, you made a new friend over here in the chat, which is cool. Or an old, <laughs> met an old friend, rather. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, yeah, Northeast Ohio coming coming out in an Armenian wine panel. I mean, who would you know? <laughs> I mean, see, this is wine brings people together, like we're saying. Exactly right. <laughs> I should really fast. There's a couple of questions about where to see the films. I should say um, uh, somtv.com has hundreds of hours of, of high production value stuff. This is not just like lessons. 
this is real documentaries and feature films and my new feature films up there. So that's somtv.com. The Armenian wine panels there. My next film called the cup of salvation, which deals with this will be there. Um, the three films, if you have Hulu, Psalm one, two, and three are on Hulu as well. Um, in the United States at least, but yeah, anyone who's on Psalm TV, I'll buy you a beer. If you ever, uh, if you ever see me in a bar, I owe you a beer for subscribing. Anyways, that's my plug. Absolutely. I just actually, um, I put the link there for everybody again. It was at the top, but in case you came a little late, I've now added it back in there as well. Um, but again, I don't want to take up too much of everyone's time. This has been so informative. I feel like we could have spoken for at least another hour or two. Maybe we'll do a part two next time and maybe we'll see. Um, but uh, thank you all so much for being here. Vanessa, Armen, Jason, Kamal, Wine Access. Um, like I said, telling these stories, bringing them to the forefront, so important, especially for um, anyone that's into wine, new into the journey, seasoned into the journey, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, especially right now in, in these trying times, uh, telling and sharing these stories is so important, which is why I encourage everyone as well to watch Jason's films. Um, super exciting stuff coming out of Armenia and we're happy to shed a little bit of a light on it. Um, I'd love for uh, Vanessa some final thoughts followed by Kamal. Absolutely. Well, maybe we can have our part two after uh, after the film comes out, Jason. Maybe we'll uh, be back here and, and and have even more to discuss. But um, if I no, get to I just... do this again, I'm in. Let's do it. <laughs> me too. Me too. Any any day, I'd be excited to to drink this. Um, so no, I just again wanted to thank um, Devanji Hilt Living Kamal um, for organizing this great panel. Um, Armen and Jason again to to echo what Devanji said. You know, this is. It, it's really just scratching the surface, but I think that again is what's so intriguing is that there's so much more to learn and I look forward to learning more, you know, from the film um, and and just from staying in touch with you you folks and, and learning more. But again, anyone who wants to try these wines, you know, wineaccess.com backslash Armenia, uh, you can view the wines there um, and just really, really excited to to have something that I'm, I'm genuinely passionate about and um, I look forward to continue until I roll up my sleeves and, and learn more. And I'd like to thank Wine Access for being progressive in leading us into this conversation, creating this platform for us to share something that's, you know, far from typical of what we're, you know, everyone's normally doing. So thank you for shining this light in Armenia on the culture, especially in these times. As I mentioned, I have super close friends that have become family that have joined this conversation and found this uh, super informative. Uh, so thank you, Armin. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Devanchi. And once again, Wine Access, you guys are the best in the yeah. game. Um, yeah. Every bottle tells a story, but this tells an even deeper story and connects it, you know, more real emotion. So thank you for you know, this journey. Thank you guys thank so you much. Have a great weekend. Take care. Okay. Right. Bye. Bye bye everyone. Bye, thank thank you. you.